You may ask yourself how you got here. To that, my dear Watson, I would say, when you have eliminated all better shows, whatever remains, how improbable, you must be watching The Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you the news interviews from the Geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I am your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my buddy, Mike Kafis. Hey, everybody. My other buddy, Jack Ballard. Hello. And hey, my other buddy, our guest this week, uh, Bryce Whitaker. How you doing? Bryce is the mastermind of Fear Light Games uh, and has worked on various projects in the gaming industry. Aside from being the creator of Baker Street, role-playing in the world of Sherlock Holmes, and Hood's swashbuckling adventures in Sherwood. He has written miniature rules for Fearlight Games, historical source material for Rogue Games, and the colonial gothic setting, providing a few missions for uh, Guerrilla Games Battle Stations uh, property and worked for Margaret Weiss's production on Marvel Super Heroes. And uh, I just read that last bit like I've never read an intro in my life. So, <laughs> so hey, <laughs> hey, Bryce, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I only do this every week, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so Bryce, you got this. Uh, I want to. I want to start with. I want to start with Baker Street because that sure. that's how I discovered your stuff. And here, hold on, let me give me. Da, 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 I love that song. What song? Baker Street. There's a song Baker Street. Oh, is that a? Uh, is it like a Billy Joel song or something? I don't know who sings it. Yeah, I'm not but, sure either. <laughs> The show goes, and the show grinds to a halt. Sixteen seconds. I gets in right. (laughs) Hey, we warned you all. So, so Baker, basic uh, Baker Street is uh, is a Sherlock Holmes game, and I'm I'm just going to go out on a limb here and assume that you're a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yeah. Basic uh, Baker Street is uh, a Sherlock Holmes game. Oh, come on, no, I'm just going to go out. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Normally Twitch is uh, is silent. I'm trying to monitor it, and it started. All right, anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bryce. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I am a, a Sherlock Holmes fan. Uh, I have watched the old Basil Rathbones. That's where I started, uh, and then uh, the Jeremy Bretts as well. Um, and now everybody is kind of in the the two camps right now between uh, the BBC Benedict Cumberbatch oh, yeah. and the American Elementary. Um, they f- tend to fall into those camps, and then every once in a while, you have a weirdo who likes uh, Robert Downey Jr. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Where do you fall, Bryce? Uh, you know, I, I'm a huge Jeremy Brett fan. Uh, I, I will say this about you know Robert Downey Jr. gets a lot of flack for um for his Sherlock, but in order for that character to be to resonate with modern cra- uh, modern crowd. There has to be a lot more action adventure, uh, and I think that's the proper direction of the character in, in his evolution. He was also a boxing champ. I mean, Conan Doyle wrote about this, um, so the the fight scenes are not um, not uh, atypical. Uh, it was just something that was never really explored in the original books, just mentioned. Yeah, I got to tell you, I was uh, I haven't read a whole lot of Sherlock Holmes, uh, and when I was watching the movie. They were, you know, they're going to the whole fight thing. And I, I ha- I'll i admit, I was like, oh, this is so dumb. They got to put this kind of stuff. They got to put this action scene in. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. He's also the greatest fighter in the world, too. Right. And then I was talking to I was talking to our buddy, John Borman, Mr. Mr. Anti uh, anti everything. Right. And he goes, well, actually, and I'm like, Fuck. <laughs> like damn it. <laughs> My rage was unwarranted. I'm all loud and dumb, you know, <laughs> so, but uh but those fight scenes are pretty cool. I mean, you know. Yeah, they- you know, one of the things I, I uh, would have liked to see more of that is the way they broke down fight scenes. I wish they would have broke down crime scenes. Oh, yeah. Movie. Right. Uh, and, and had him thinking in, in that kind of unreal time uh, and, and showed his manic uh, thought process. And I think that would have been uh, made the movies better. Right. Yeah, it was it was more of like the After Effects thing, you know, where he was explaining it. And he's like, "Well, because of this and because of that, and because." But you're right. If they'd have done it right in the moment, when he instead of going back to his discovery, you know, right. going through that while he was doing it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Um. So in the the Sherlock Holmes game, I think 
I think the uh, uh, the thing I found that was really uh, like I don't kind of turned me on to it the most when we did the the thing on game school was that clue system. I, I was when we were doing that, I was like, oh my god, this this is really cool. I wish more games had something like this, you know, because it's it's usually you go into the adventure and you I want to do an investigation. Okay, you make a roll. Okay, this is what you're given. All right, and then that's it. And that like your character could have a skill that he uses. Or they use you know once every other adventure you know and it, the skill is so much more you know finding clues and solving solving uh, uh, you know uh, mysteries and stuff is way more involved than that I mean so much more involved than that but what you've done is is you've made that come to life so can can you talk about how that works Yeah um, you know uh, it's interesting the the original prototype was. Uh, a means, motive, and opportunity bulletin board where you drew lines to clues. Uh, and it was so convoluted and so awful, my players threw dice at me. Um, <laughs> and that was that was the first version of that. Uh, and then I made this clue system, and this clue system everybody loved. And then about two years ago at Origins, I had all my buddies that had thrown the dice at me in a game. And one of the players goes, you know what this game needs is a bulletin board linking clues. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just turned to those guys and I go, I told you. No. Right. <laughs> uh, but no, the clue system is, is very is very neat. Uh, you, As a team, you're, you're participating as a team. You all roll observation. Uh, adding dice to, to one lead investigator role. So everybody's chipping in dice. That reveals a number of clues. And then when you get a clue, it tells you what the clue is. And the clue could be true to the case, relevant to the case, or it could be something that's in the room that that is just there, it was there before the crime, was there to design to throw you off the track. So then you make a, a reason role as a team. And the reason role gives you a number of yes or no questions to ask the mastermind. And you will go, is this clue relevant? Is that clue relevant? And the mastermind, I've, I've kind of gone to a thumbs up, thumb down system. And if you if it's not relevant to the case, you can crumple up the clue and, and get rid of it. Uh, if it is relevant to the case, it will have three leads next to it. And two of the leads will be false. One lead will be true to the case, and it gives you a very vague direction in where to go. Uh, we're not really leading people by the nose. We're just saying, here's the idea that progresses you uh, through the investigation. So you get an idea where it's going. Uh, and then you have to, to end the round. So you've done observation to find clues. You've done reason to rule out false clues. And now you move on to deduction. And that gives you a number of yes or no questions to rule out leads as false or true leads. Uh, and then as a team, you discuss before you ask the mastermind what clues and leads to ask about, uh, because you're more efficient if you can rule out uh, the false clues and you're more efficient if you can pick the right lead uh, on a clue. And then when you get to the end of that round, uh, a lot of times you will not have all the answers. Most of the time you'll not have all the answers. So you can take another investigative round. Uh, and go through uh, observation, reason, and deduction again. And when you do that, you will increase the threat meter. And the threat meter is a list of things that will go against the investigators in the case. Some of them may be plot-oriented. Um, the bad guys get wise to the fact that they're being investigated, or they send thugs out to attack you. Other things are mechanical in nature. Uh, they cause the Sherlock die to act weird and, and not in the favor of the players uh, or they eat your resolve and that's basically how a, a clue scene works so it's, a, it's it's dice rolling yes but it's also a lot of um conferring with your teammates to figure out the, the proper way that things happen in the proper way you should proceed okay fantastic yeah that sounds fun yeah, it's neat. We we played it. It sounds. I mean, it sounds. I I don't know if you if you're not actually playing it. It sounds like it could be a little complicated, but it's not. It's not complicated at all. It really isn't. Uh, to to explain it without actually doing any of it, it's a little complex. You're like, we do this, and then you do that. It's like, no, 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 it's real simple. It's just it's laid out. It's really clear. And it's it's cool because, you know, um, a lot of times in in role playing games, if if uh, you make a bad investigation roll, the the game master can give you a clue. That is obviously wrong, right? But you made the roll, so the problem with that is, is that you have to play completely out of game and go, oh yeah, I know, fuck, I, I screwed that roll up. So I have to act like this is a good piece of information, which is tough. But with with what Bryce is doing, that doesn't happen. 
you know, it's just yeah. you either get clues or you don't. And then, you know, you guys talk about ruling it out and it's, you know, the, there is some deciphering on the player's end, but, uh, you know, with, with the amount of clues that you get, that's your character giving you more. So if you're better at investigation, you get more clues, right? So it's, it's right. easier. And then you work yeah. as a team. So you all work together. And, and like, you know, in most games, it's everybody goes to look for clues and they're all on their own. You know, it's just like, I'm over here looking at clues. Get away. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, and that's, that's usually how it goes. So I like this. It's really cool. Hey, I got a question. Have there been times when people get wrong clues uh, and are still able to bumble their way through the entire adventure and still end up solving it? Like kind of a, an Inspector Clouseau-esque way but it, it, it does that work sometimes it does um one of, one of the things that you move on from an investigation scene is an interview scene and in an interview scene you can ask uh witnesses and suspects questions but the number of questions is limited and if you go to another set of questions it raises that threat meter and my, my players will tell you one of my favorite things to do is they'll ask like like the, normally you can ask for and they'll ask the fifth question and, and the person they're talking to goes, I'd like to tell you that, but you'll have to increase the threat meter. <laughs> 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 and so they, they sit there and decide, is that piece of information worth it? Uh, and so I've had it, I've had uh, adventures where they haven't gotten the clues in the investigation scene, but they've managed to ask the right questions of the witnesses in order to get back on track. Uh, which is really interesting. Also, I think our game may be the only one that has false leads in it. A lot of times with mystery games, all your clues are kind of relevant. Uh, and when you take a false clue, if you haven't processed it and you haven't found out it's false, you can follow it as far as the mastermind wants to take you. Uh, so you can go on a full adventure investigating this side lead that is completely unimportant. Yeah. But at some point, the mastermind will go, you've reached a dead end. And we're increasing the threat meter. Uh, and what's great about that is, is masterminds can then decide how far down the rabbit hole they want to go. Do I want my players to waste a bunch of time on this? Or are my players having fun playing their characters? And this is kind of a, a fun thing to go do. All right. Hey, I got a, I got a supplement for that game now that we're talking about it. You All right. The, the Dirk Gently plug in, right? <laughs> Where... You, you pretty much have to bumble through all your stuff. Like, all you get are stupid clues. And you just kind of wander around until you solve it. Inspector Gadget. Yeah, Inspector yeah. Gadget. The Pink Panther. Yeah. Right? yeah. That yeah. would be fun. Uh, we, have, we have one case in our um, Jack the Ripper book. Uh, and one of the neat things about history is prior to Sherlock Holmes, the um, Scotland Yard basically operated under the premise a crime was committed uh, you found the nearest criminal. You asked him if he did it. He said no. You beat the crap out of him. You asked him if he did it. He said yes. And that's how you solved crimes. <laughs> and so we have this whole Whitechapel Vigilance Committee where we replace reason and deduction and observation with uh, things like fight and intimidate. Okay. And that's how you get the clues. Right. Uh, and so that it creates a whole different kind of adventure feel. Yeah, we call that the Baltimore City Police Department here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard about them. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to send them a copy of my uh, of that adventure, and I'll get it. Yeah, they, they were like, "This is a game, <laughs> <laughs> right? This is an SOP." Right. They can't read. Come right. on. <laughs> <laughs> BCPD. Um, <laughs> so you were you were talking about this uh, this Sherlock die. Uh, tell me how that works. That's it's, it's a special die. It's a six sided with a Sherlock head on it, right? Yeah. So uh, what you do in the game is it's a. Uh, I like to design games in layers, and the first layer is very simple. You have a skill that has a value. So you might have observation at a four. You roll four D6s and four fives and sixes are successes. And you need a certain number of successes. Now that's the first layer. Now in every roll that you make in the game, you add a Sherlock die, or as my players call it, the Moriarty die. Um, <laughs> and if a, it, the die is a D6, it's got a one, two, and three side. And anytime that it shows a one, two, or three, one, two, or three in your roll are successes. 
So if I roll a one, one, four, five, six, and I roll a one on the Sherlock dice, all my dice are successes. Ooh. Then I have a two that would make all the twos and all the three successes. Then you have a Dr. Watson result. Dr. Watson will allow you to have a free success. Uh, Sherlock is the wild die. He lets you call any ones, twos, or threes in your role as success is your choice. And then uh, the evil professor Moriarty subtracts failures from successes. So if you have three failures and three successes and you roll Mar Moriarty with the roll, you actually have zero successes. And it's just a little extra wrinkle to the game to add a little more complexity. Uh, and it also allows me to mess with that die uh, during the threat meter increases. Uh, because it, when it starts out, it's very helpful to the players. Uh, but it, you might increase the threat meter four or five times during a case. Then it will not be so helpful to the investigators. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Hmm. It's neat. Yeah, so, I, I, I like that a lot. So, um... So real quick, we got a we got a guy in the in the chat room, Gate Jumper One. I don't I don't know who that is, but but that's his name. Uh, <laughs> he wants to know uh, about character creation. Can you go over character creation a little bit? Sure. So in the core book, uh, there's about uh, 30, 35 professions. I can't remember offhand. You pick a profession that you had in Victorian society prior to being an investigator. The game takes place in 1891. Uh, Sherlock has, is gone missing from about 1891 to about 1894. Uh, and so Dr. Watson is hiring you to take these cases. So you pick a profession. That gives you uh, five skills and three specialties. When you get those, you write them down on your character sheet. And then you take 30 investigator points and build the rest of your character buying skills and specialties uh, however you want. Uh, so your previous profession does ha does feed into your character, uh, and then at that point you are an investigator working for Dr. Watson. The process takes uh, I don't know maybe maybe twenty minutes. Uh, I would put it less crunchy than say a three point five system, um, but maybe more crunchy than um, uh, something like Dungeon World. It's somewhere in the middle there. Okay, and uh, just for the the fans, you can't none of us can see this. Only the people watching it on Twitch can see this. Uh, I put up a, in the, the little image window, I put up a, the character sheet so they can take a look at that real quick uh, before we before we move on. I'll leave it up just another second or two so they can zoom in on it or whatever. I was about to ask uh, what, what year this all took place in, if it was in the traditional time, if it was modern day. Is there is there any, uh, is that set in stone, the time period? Have you ever considered doing like a modern day take on it or uh, or or anything along those lines or just strictly traditional well, yeah, when we were in the Kickstarter, we had um, we had a few requests for Cthulhu. We've had a few requests for Steampunk. Huh. Uh, and cool. we've had a few requests for Supernatural uh, and a few requests for Modern Day. Um, and I, I, out of all of those, I think the one that interests me most is probably Modern Day. And I, w I would think that if we do go that route, it'll be... Um, like a source book that's just added to the game that just changes yeah. the skills up gotcha. uh, and, and talks a little bit about in, in our game, we, we, we really dive into how you're supposed to behave as a Victorian. Um, <laughs> right. It wouldn't be so, so important in modern day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And that, and with that, you don't even, you know, you wouldn't even have to go into that. You could just say, forget all this Victorian stuff. Just, you know, right. you, you know what today is like, you wouldn't even have to write right. about any of that. I mean, it could be like a, you could probably do that with like, I don't know what a very thin little book to PDF add on, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think it'd be very easy, and it really just comes to changing a few skills and adding um, modern day uh, careers professions, um, right? And you could just be off and running with it. What are the current uh, careers that you have to choose from um, in the current? Uh, well, you have antiques dealer, uh, <laughs> apothecary. Uh, what else? Gentleman, worldly adventurer. Ooh. Uh, there's a retired army captain. Uh, there's some new professions in the uh, Sherlock by Gaslight supplement, which is our half London source book, half Jack the Ripper uh, campaign. Uh, for instance, this will be uh, hopefully this will be new to you guys, but there was a, a profession called a knocker up in Victorian society. Now, do any of you know what a knocker up did? I can take a guess. Uh, 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 okay. I'm going to guess that it's not what I and Pete was thinking. <laughs> 
No, it's not what I was thinking. <laughs> it's the person that wakes people up in the morning. It's like the, yeah. the alarm clock you hire. That is correct. They would take a yeah. long stick and they would wrap on your window. Mm -hmm. And they, they were the early version of an alarm clock. And a lot of times police officers did it because they would have their beats, which were a certain block radius, and they would supplement their income by uh, not, oh, by knocking on waking people up. So, and you can okay. play one. I was yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, being a police officer back then sucked. You didn't get – you got paid almost nothing. Uh, I think didn't they have to buy their own – like the I don't think they were allowed to have them in London, mm -hmm. but I know in America – uh, they had to buy their own guns, I think, didn't they? If they wanted to have one, like yeah. you didn't, you didn't necessarily have a gun. You didn't need one for the job. You had a whistle, right? <laughs> right. It started it started off as a rattle, yeah, uh, in, in the eighteen sixties and seventies, and then went to a whistle from that. Uh, another neat thing of the Victorian police that came about uh, pretty much near the Jack the Ripper camp um, uh, scenario is uh, they got uh, rubber soles on their shoes. And they, uh, this is where the term, at least in Britain, sneakers came from. The police officers became sneakers because before you could hear them coming. And so you would commit a crime. And if you heard someone walking towards you, you'd have plenty of time to get away. Uh, and they wanted to catch people. So they began to outfit the uh, blue bottles or uh, uh, constables with uh, rubber soles. Huh. Oh, neat. Very That's cool. pretty cool. Now, I'm pretty familiar with the Victorian era. Uh, you know the public toilet system that they'd have where there was a gentleman with a large overcoat and a bucket and you would pay him and he would stand over you and, and pull out his large overcoat so you could poop in the bucket. Um, hmm. Is that in the game? Uh, <laughs> that, would, that would be my profession. You know, that, that would be one that I would love to add. Uh, there, is, <laughs> there is a neat location in uh, Sherlock by Gaslight. Um, it, basically in 1858, they had a, a big thing called the Big Stink that caused them to uh, create a, a better sewage system. Uh, and they built this ridiculous gold and building. It had uh, inlaid pictures and art. Abbey Mills pumping station, I think was the name of it. <laughs> it became known as the cathedral of sewage. Mm, <laughs> nice. 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 And just like that, Jack was out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Now I have to go fumigate all my codes. <laughs> so, so, uh, so another, we got another one from the uh, chat room. Dad game. John says, uh, why did you decide to build a game around Sherlock Holmes rather than your own mythos? Wow. Um, well, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the exact reason this came about. I had just taken a, I had just taken a break from writing some professional projects and I was doing a homebrew game set in the Victorian times, but I wanted to use my own deep investigation mechanics. And I was playing around at the time with a lot of ideas. And my wife came in and asked, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing this mystery thing. She goes, well, sort of like Sherlock Holmes. And I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, well, has there ever been a Sherlock Holmes role-playing game? And I go, I don't think there has been. Hmm. And so I looked, I looked around and it seemed to be the one hole that existed you know half the time in this industry well more than half the time 90 percent of the time no idea is new uh it's been done mm -hmm. and uh, i was very fortunate that there had not been uh a, a published role-playing game and we had gotten involved with the estate and this has been several years before it was uh, most of it was public domain i think there's still six stories that are um still covered by um rights but uh, we worked out a deal with the estate, and uh, that was that was how it came about. Oh, very cool! Very very cool. All right, so uh, blah 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 blah. Where are we on time? Okay, so let's let's move on to unless there's anything else you want to say about uh, Baker Street, which is a fantastic game. I love it. Um, if you wanted to say anything else about uh, about that before I move on to Hood, I think uh, it's just. Oh, oh, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, I was like, it's a perfect time to switch gears because that way we can kind of talk to uh, Dad Game John about uh, a game that you are developing that uh, is of your own genre, sort of, right? Well, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that we had a fantastic Origins. We ran 16 events uh, at the Origins Game Fair that were all sellouts. Oh. Uh, I had a just a deep, deep love for Baker Street from all the fans there. And it's going to result in next year there being a Baker Street live event. 
Nice. Uh, a game designer uh, is going to be murdered. <laughs> we're going to try to figure out who it was. So. Oh, that's excellent. Oh. Yeah. So like live theater type of LARPy sort of thing? Yeah, we're going to work with uh, the people at Kettle of Fish. They do a lot of the, the LARPs at Origins. And, and I sat down and I told them I wanted it to be a LARP, but I want it to be a very structured LARP and something that could be done in an hour so that we can move as many people through it uh, as possible so everybody gets a little bit of a taste. And at the end, we're going to have some sort of scoring system. I haven't written it yet, but you'll be able to see how well you did compared to Sherlock. Oh, sweet. Cool. That's very really cool. cool. Very cool. Hmm. All right, so you got you got this uh, you got this new game out. It's not I don't even think it's on shelves just yet. Uh, your Kickstarter finished up uh, successfully. Hood Swashbuckling Adventures in Sherwood. Um, so so all right, so you've gone from uh, you've, you've gone from Sherlock Holmes to Robin Hood. Uh, right. I guess you are a Robin Hood fan. I am. Uh, I uh, was a fan ever since I was a little kid, and I watched the uh, the nineteen thirty eight uh, Errol Flynn Robin Hood. Uh, and this was this was a choice of of something I wanted to do as a result of getting as far away from Baker Street as possible. Right. Um, I love Baker Street, but I will tell you they they are the hardest adventures to write. <laughs> I bet um, yeah. yeah, you have to be logical and precise with every beat in that adventure. And I just decided, hey, I want to do something that's kind of fun and swashbuckling, and, and I don't have to. Uh, think that precisely right um, that's why hood came about yeah i would imagine that um dms who buy baker street and they, they run it for their own groups um they, they might be cursing your name if their players really like the game because like oh these adventures oh my god you know writing their own adventures uh has got to be uh got to be time because i mean as rewarding as it is it's got you know like you said you got to go through every uh thing because if you give them a clue that doesn't make any sense your players gonna be like well, I don't understand. You gave us this clue and you said it was relevant, but it didn't have anything to do with anything. Like, oh, yeah, I missed that. I, forgot. I wrote something out. And yeah. Right, um, right. And, and the feedback we get, the number one feedback is, I can't write my own adventures. Help me. Right. Uh, and it, it's resulted in almost every product in the, the Baker Street line just being more adventures. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm happy to share my expertise. Uh, we have this neat little thing where when, you, when you're given a clue, I have to run it by... Uh, a bunch of people who aren't gamers uh, because early on I had my own syntax that gave away the, the proper lead. Uh, and it was just a, a way of using grammar that people would go, that's it. That's it. Right. And um, so now I tell all, everybody who writes their own adventures, just have someone look it over. Right. Yeah. 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 But, uh, but with hood, you get to, you get to be more. You do crazy. You right. Squashbuckling. And yeah, yeah. swashbuckling is a very uh, visual style. And what I decided very early on with, with the mechanics is that I was going to replace the idea of I attack. Every role-playing game, uh, at least sometimes, will boil down to players just going I attack. And in Hood, you can't do that. You can't say I attack. You come up with your own stunt, and it could be something like uh, we have a character named Dwight Large, who is a uh, dwarf. <laughs> He's a dwarf in uh, in Sherwood, and uh, he had takes. He's a quarter staff fighter, and he always he the, the player that plays him the most always has death from below, uh, and that's his <laughs> <story>. nice. <laughs> uh, and it's very visual. It gives us all a, a great idea of what's happening. Uh, he also has one called "Not in the Sisters," right? Which, <laughs> <laughs> for that uh, that uh, in between legs attack. Uh, right. And so that's what Hood is. It's it's about having fun with combat. Uh, you get away from I attack. You explain your whole, whole story pool uh, and how you're doing things. Uh, and it's that interaction that gives it the, the swashbuckling feel from the old movies. Oh, all right. Cool, cool. Yeah, so so you said you, you mentioned story pool. Uh, explain, tell us how a story pool works. Because I was watching your video, your Kickstarter video, and, and you went through that pretty – pretty well um about how you like you build it and what i'm gonna do while you're doing that i am gonna pull up the character sheet for yeah uh, for hood 
so that uh, so people can see. Let's do that. Okay, there we go. So I got the character sheet up. So if you all want to follow along, there's these uh, little circles on the side, uh, down you know down throughout the character sheet, probably uh, quarter way down, all the way down to the bottom. And each one of these circles is a place you put a die, and then because yeah. that's how you did it in the video. So I, I figured you could just talk to it like that. Sure. So so the first thing you have is uh, skills and professions, and when I go to to make a story pool role, I'm going to pick a skill or profession that applies to the role. And I'm going to say, I'm going to use my archery because I'm going to shoot. And you take that archery die, which could be anything from a D4 to a D12, and you place it on the first target. And then the next thing you go, you do is you look over your person, your personality and your physical traits. And you pick one from a personality or a physical trait that might apply. So maybe you have keen eyes at a D12. And you would take that D12 and you would put it in the next target. Then you move down the targets again to virtues and vices. Now, virtues and vices sort of replace the idea of alignment in this game. Uh, and you pick a virtue or vice that applies. So maybe uh, you're being extremely loyal to the merry men and you have uh, loyalty at a D6 or D8, D8. So you'd pick the D8 and you'd put it in the third target. Next are your stunts. And your stunts replace the idea of I attack. And you always get two dice for the stunts. So let's say you haven't designed a, uh, a, a stunt yet for your archery. And you go, well, I'm going to make this a pinning strike. I'm going to pin this uh, sh one of the sheriff's men to the tree. So you pick up two D4 because all stunts start at D4s. And you put those on those two targets. And finally, you get to pick one piece of equipment that you have that you're going that's going to help you with this role. And in this case, it would probably be a bow, although you could theoretically say the tree behind me or uh, the arrow that you have. Uh, and you would pick that dice up and you'd put it in the final target. Then you pick all the dice up and you roll them. And a one, two, or three is a failure. And fours and up are successes. And this is the point where we get to that's very much like Baker Street. Uh, the Robin Hood die is set up exactly like the Baker Street die. Um, so you have one, two, three. Uh, Marion's a free success. Robin lets you call one, twos, or threes as successes. And the evil sheriff takes failures from successes. So that's the one element that's the same from Baker Street to Hood. Uh, of course, in, in Hood, you're using all sorts of dice. In Baker Street, you're just using D6s. Okay. 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 Cool. It sounds very complicated, but, but when you walk through all the steps it becomes very, very clear. Uh, and you start to tell your own little story as you go through it. Uh, you can climb a tree and then somersault using your acrobatics to land on someone's back, uh, calling it a sword stab and then using your, you know, great sword to do it. Huh, fantastic. That's pretty cool. Thank you. You must be a pretty big uh, history buff, Bryce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a degree in history from Ball State University. Uh, and I, I think that's what landed me my first job with Colonial uh, Gothic. Uh, I wrote the French and Indian War supplement for that game, uh, which required awesome. a lot of history. So, yes, I love history. Yeah, I got a degree in history from Cock University. We should get together. Yeah, yeah. Cock and ball. That's uh, <laughs> what I, <laughs> Jesus. I, no, I do have a degree in history. Yeah, um, but but no, that's that is really cool. I I, I love historically accurate games like that, or, or and 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 those strategy games. That's really fascinating. And the French and Indian War was really the first World War. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, that's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've used my degree quite a bit, uh, just not as a teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at least one of us is. <laughs> good point so i've always i've always wondered who because i could never find out who won against the french and the indians was it i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> i kid i kid I'll, I'll be back next week and we'll go over that <laughs> he's an engineer so he just builds shit he doesn't know what happened before that right he's, yeah math no, I, I'm a. I, I like history. I like the history. I, I listen to hardcore history. Uh, oh, I love so, that podcast. That's the best. Yeah, it is. So, um, so that okay. So you got the eye, and you call it the icon die for uh for for hood, right? That, that's basically your Sherlock dies, your icon dies, same basic thing. Um, but now there's there's also uh, I noticed you had uh, in here combat and story artifacts. Yes, um, and these these are cards that you get, right? Yeah. So you can buy the Sherwood deck. Um, 
And a Sherwood deck is just a way of organizing your, your game. You don't need it uh, to play the game, but it, it comes with all this stuff that allows you not to look at the rules. Uh, you just put it on the table, and you don't even need the rule book anymore once you've read it once. Now like you're that. talking. Now you're talking, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's like you designed it for me. <laughs> yeah, except Mike could lose that, too. <laughs> oh, God. Jesus. Man, you're on fire tonight, Jack. You're on can fire. You the, can you get the rule book tattooed on your palm? <laughs> 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 oh I'm my sorry, God. Mike. I'm sorry. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway, anyway, so combat and artifact. <laughs> so these are cards you get. Now I noticed that, like one of the cards I have uh, that's been cycling through the 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 uh, thing on here is um, is a cursed item. Yes. Um, so hold on, let me. Uh... I put the shift slide. I turn the slideshow off. Let me turn it back on. Oh right, yeah, so you can get a cursed item, which um, is that like now? I, I this game doesn't have magic in it, does it? Magic is addressed is is a very interesting thing. Uh, it, it is always something that happens that that is explainable to a logical person. So if you are logical as a virtue, uh, you will always say, "Well, it happened because of this." Uh, so if you go up against the witch, there is like the evil witch of Pepplewick in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. She can cast a spell that might uh, use a plant to entwine your legs. Uh, but what the logical person will say is you, in fact, tripped over a root. <laughs> I love it. What, what the superstitious it. person will say is, uh, oh, my God, she's a witch. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, you leave it very ambiguous. It's another word. Like she's not shooting you with lightning bolts or anything like that. It's right. just. Uh, right. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jack. I love it. That's a skeptics game right there. I like, I like that. that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it get could into be a lot of fights about it. We, I mean, the players, there'll be logical players and superstitious players playing because that's what on, is on their virtues and vices, and they won't get along, and they'll fight the whole time about what, how, how it is. It's is it the devil? Is it just some common occurrence? And these are the characters, <laughs> not the players, right? The players right. are all good spirit. They know that it's their characters. Right. 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 Okay. Get fantastic. The character and they argue. Yeah. Oh, that's hey. fun. Hey Jack, Mama Mars says yeah. stop picking on Mike. Oh, <laughs> his mommy came in. Oh, oh. <laughs> you the guys are laughing at me, Mom. Stop. <laughs> so Bryce, just in case you don't know, Mike's mom is like our biggest fan. It's awesome. She she checks out every show. She's that's she's, awesome. She's our favorite. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She role play. And, uh, Mike. You know what? She would. She would. Uh, she's just never. <laughs> none of her friends are uh, your uh, role players. They're not in that demo. Right. <laughs> about fifty years past that demo. Right. <laughs> I don't know, man. She might have been old enough for Gary. Might have been old enough for her. Uh yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, but that's true. Uh, you know, it, it's good enough. She's getting into Marvel. She's getting into. Uh, a lot of different stuff. I know she would. Uh, she would get a kick out of it. Uh, yeah. Mom, go go find a role playing group. Didn't you say she's she's like super big in Lord of the Rings? Oh yeah, she is yeah. like uh, knows any and everything about Tolkien. You you ask her any question, she knows it. Oh, oh play, play one ring. I, I uh, Francisco and I talk a lot about his game designs, and One Ring is a phenomenal game. I love it. There you go, Mama Marsh. One ring. That's the game. There you go. That's the game yeah. you're going to play. And uh, Dave is going to, uh, he'll DM you. He'll D he could do it online, too. That's right. We should do that. Mike, we should do that. We should get a game up with your with your mom online. That'd be, that would be awesome. We can film, we wow. can like, record it and everything. You know, we, we don't want to scare off our eight watch we, people we're I know, watching I got right you. now. All right, all right, anyway, all right, sorry, I mean, we got sorry everybody. People in the chat room right now. <laughs> sorry, Come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> she says, Oh, she says go pick on him now, Mike. All right. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so you've got you've got um you also got this this pluck. All right, so this was interesting. A pluck and swashbuckling momentum. What what is that? Ooh. That sounds interesting. Yeah. So uh, in the game, you earn pluck. Uh, pluck is sort of the currency of the game. We all seen games like this. Oh, uh, like you pluck the bu uh, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it could be you know what what would we call those? Uh, in fate, fate points. points. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff sure. like that. Bennies. Uh, yeah, Benny's. Benny's is a, is a good name, too. Uh, so you earn that stuff, and then you can use them to break the game. So you can take extra attacks, extra moves. Uh, you can do uh, sort of over-the-top things with that. Uh, and then if you're 
your moves are over the top and they're particularly cinematic. You can earn a thing called swashbuckling momentum and swashbuckling momentum is either something you have or you don't. You're either in, in the momentum or you're not. And you can use that in conjunction with pluck to do some of the more fancier moves uh, in the game. So it, it, it allows it to be a little more cinematic. If your creativity and you're in that moment, uh, it will help you rely on the cinematics of it instead of the uh, what? Are you, what am I trying to say? Instead of the uh, uh, getting weighted down with the mechanics of a game, saying, "Oh, you had a roll for that." Okay, I yeah, like right. that. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. And the more, the more it rewards you for being more cinematic. Mm -hmm. So you want to be more and more over the top. And and Robin Hood, of course, is in a historical era, but this game is very clearly meant to be the. Uh, the men in not the Mel Brooks men in tights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <But>, Abe Lincoln. <laughs> you brought that on yourself, Bryce. No one was going. Yeah, it was coming. Good. You walked right into that. That was. I did. I did. <laughs> Again, and you, you can do that with this game. Um, Could, I, yeah, just don't, just don't yeah, talk. Yeah. Right. Oh, that would be a great add-on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we need. Man, I need to get into business of writing like like uh, uh, parody add-ons for people's games. They don't, as long as they don't take it as the wrong way. Like, no, no, no. I love your game. That's why I'm writing it. I'm not making fun of it. This is <laughs> this is it's what I do because I'm it's dumb like that. Yeah, it's a tribute, right? <laughs> I'll tell you, I, if I had a nickel for every person that's come to me and asked for a Scooby Doo version of Baker Street, right? Oh, yeah, shit, oh. that is cool. Well, who would yeah. ever thought of that? I can see and, that. you know, the thing is, is I really don't like Scooby-Doo, so I am not. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's I, fine. I can see people playing it and good for them, but oh, don't make me write that. Yeah. Well, Jack, why don't you just pop a couple Scooby snacks and uh, you can write that for him? Yeah, I'm not a big fan either, really. I just oh, I'd like to be shaggy for an afternoon, but yeah. I, there's really nothing. There's really nothing. Yeah, that's that's a. I think that would be a great in the uh, 14, 15, 16 year old market. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it that would be, be like a pre teen kind of game. You know, or a family game. Yeah, or a family game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It'd be like, you know what it'd be good? You know, I'll tell you what it'd be good for. It'd be good to run at cons, um, at conventions, and have like kids show up and play. That would be where it'd be really good. Mm. Um, I, I like doing yeah. Gonzo stuff like that at cons. We, we did a, uh, a Total Con one year, we did a Saturday morning cartoon. Uh, event oh. where we we had a room we had our own they gave us our own room to do this and everybody had to do a Saturday morning cartoon and we did it Saturday morning at like yeah. eight a.m. which is the last time I'll do anything at a convention <laughs> eight a.m. because I'm not extremely a, successful though it was yeah, extremely it was. successful dude it was and super the diehard role players were there they yeah. were we encouraged people to wear their bathrobes and we served milk and cereal and orange yep. juice and stuff dude it was awesome it went over really well so that's the kind of yeah. game that you do there be cool. I have I actually have a game I run once a year that's uh, at Hoosier Con. It's a, a free convention here in Indiana, which is He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Nice. It's, oh, an, cool. it's a Saturday game. Uh, you get cereal and milk. Yeah. Uh, it's run with Cartoon Action Hour, and it has nice. uh, rules for commercials. So I, I download all the commercials that were the original play toys. Oh, yeah. And we have a moment for Schoolhouse Rocks, and Schoolhouse Rocks has a mechanical benefit. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Remember the orange guy that would make you that would teach you how to make frozen popsicles? Yeah, yeah. commercial for him, and yeah, it's it's a blast. We love it. Oh, that sounds cool. I, I like that kind of stuff. That's yeah, it. That's See, fun. to me, that's what makes conventions fun because you are not going to do that with your home group. You know, it's just it's just right. you know, the guys will be like, "What are you doing? This is silly, right?" But at a convention, you could do all that crazy stuff and do goofy Gonzo y stuff. All right, people so, will love it. Yeah, and they'll love it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So we already we went over the magic, uh, magic. So, one of the questions I had, and we we sort of touched on this. Um, you know, a question I had was whether it was whether Hood was com compatible with Baker Street, but you know, you're using different dice and stuff. How hard would it be uh, for it if if people wanted to, uh, I don't know, take stuff from say Hood and put it in Baker Street, or do the other way around? Is that is that a doable thing? It, it's honestly going to be pretty difficult, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you this just because. Originally, I had the idea to make this game work with D6s 
uh, and be a lot more uniform with Baker Street. And I took it to, I think, Origins two, two or three years ago, and the play tests were absolute disasters. <laughs> uh, and I, I realized that the game was not being swashbuckling. Right. Uh, it was uh, people reading their character sheets, not telling me what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I scrapped it all, right. rewrote it, and then realized when I was done, there was just enough design space to bring the die over. Okay, so the die is the only thing that the yeah. that's made. The, okay, fan, all right, that's cool. That, yeah, it's a good idea, sense. so why not? Yeah. Hey, I got a question, though, because <clears throat> is this out yet? Is Can anyone get their hands on Hood yet, or is this... Are you still in pre-development or so, pre? Uh... So Hood is uh, it's written and it's uh, it's laid out. And in fact, I don't know if you guys can see, but this is the special yeah. hard edition that uh, will be going out to uh, some Kickstarter backers soon. Uh, the PDF cool. is available uh, for the Kickstarter backers. Uh, the codes will be going out very soon for the books to get your um, soft cover, hard cover, um, printed copy. Uh, and then we're hoping that it will be in with distributors by uh, September and you'll be able to get it on your, um, from your local game store. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So you'll be able to get it in the, in the, the, the B and M, the brick and mortar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Will it, will you have it on, um, drive through RPG at all? Like any yes. electronic yeah. copies? Okay. All and right. in fact, uh, drive through does all our, <laughs> well, most of our Kickstarter fulfillment anymore. Um, there, there's some things they can't do, um, uh, with the dice, um, but the Sherwood deck and the book is all available. Uh -huh. And you can get print copies of uh, uh, Baker Street there as well, or your game store, however you want. Okay, awesome. cool. That's really cool. Fantastic. So you, uh, you, you, had, you had a note in, your, in, in your, uh, your survey there say, what's up for 2018 and Origins 2018? So what sounds like you got something big coming up for Origins 2018. Yeah, so uh, what Fearlight's working on is we're going to have uh, a new case book for Baker Street. Uh, its working title is uh, Strange Cases, Distant Places, uh, and it will be stuff that's kind of outside of London. Uh, I Just to give you a little bit of a spoiler, I know that the Hound of the Baskervilles adaptation will be in it, uh, and I have written a um, Murder on a Train Um which is on a, uh, the Flying Scotsman, which ran from Edinburgh to London. Um, and we'll have some writers for that. And then we'll do our first Hood supplement, which will be uh, probably six or seven adventures for, um, for Hood. Uh, the only one I know that's going in that one right now is uh, you get to save Alan and Adele's sweetheart so they can be wed. Um, and then uh, those will be the two the two role-playing books that will be out in 2018. And if we get it done in time, there will be a um, social deduction game, uh, sci-fi game, uh, where you'll be on a space station trying to find who among you is the alien that's killing everybody. Oh, oh cool. cool. Like that. yeah. so that's, that's going through uh, limited play testing right now. And if I can get it out uh, in, a, in a February Kickstarter, then, then it'll hit Origins. Oh, that sounds cool. I like that. Yeah, I'm looking for. All right. Uh, you know, hey, I and I was looking at um you had a, a Kickstarter some time ago that that didn't that did not fund your first one and that's not unheard of. Um but it was it was interesting. It was a, a sort of a a, a medievalish a fantasy game. Um is is that something you're still in development of? I just I happened to to catch that and it was a lot there was a lot of stuff talking about it, but um is it that's something you can are you still doing that? It, yeah, sort of. <laughs> so okay. originally, uh, originally we, we created this miniature rule system and we really like it and we've gotten a lot of good feedback on it, uh, but it didn't feature its own miniatures. It was a set of rules and cards and you had to supply your own miniatures. Uh, and this was, this has been probably six, seven years ago at this point. Uh, the first setting for it is, by the way, it's a universal miniature system, so it would have a bunch of settings that you could play against each other if you wanted to. Uh, the very first one was called Coffins and Tombstones, which was a Western setting. Uh, and we had a lot of good feedback at Origins. Uh, we were actually able to sell a few books. The Kickstarter failed because at the time we had a, um, a laser in-house at, at the Fearlight uh, garage. <laughs> uh, and we were doing our own dice and it takes about 20 custom dice to play the game. Ooh. And 
we decided to outsource, but we wanted to outsource that rather than make all our dice in house. Uh, and it, it failed because the asking amount was for all that dice production. Right, right, yeah. So we are going to revisit that game. Uh, I, I every, not a, not a week goes by that I don't get someone saying, "Well, what's up with what's up with coffins and tombstones or right. uh, gaslights and grave sites, which is the Victorian horror one." Um, and so we're going to revisit it, and it's either going to be a boxed game with cardstock minis, and it will be more playable as a, as a board game with maps or we'll provide our own miniatures for it. Uh, but it will get relaunched someday. Uh, but I have no idea when. Right. Right. You got all this other stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's actually my favorite game design. Uh, I, I think when I critique my own work, that's the one I'm most proud of. Uh, and it's just unfortunate that it didn't have its own miniatures to go with it. Uh, and that was kind of a big selling point for people. So. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, you know, we do uh, we do a lot of um, prototyping where I work and oh. you know, 3D printing and stuff. And miniatures, man, that, you know, that's no joke, man. That That is very expensive. It's very time consuming. That is a very, uh, it's an expensive time consuming process. And uh, for it to work, you got to get bulk, 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 bulk. So you got to get people to, you got to get a lot of people to buy into it. Like on a Kickstarter, they're difficult. It's difficult to run one of those as a Kickstarter. Um, and I think the people who've been very successful at it are people who are, you know, 3D modelers, and they, you know, or they know somebody who's a 3D modeler, or they, or they had a lot of startup funds to, to get, you know, um, these really cool models made up uh, ahead of time, so people would see it and they go, oh god, I got to have these models. Uh, but to like someone who's not you know, not a professional 3D modeler. That's kind of hard to pull off. Um, you know, you can't just have like regular figures and get people super excited about it because they just, it's just, it's, it's tough to do. Yeah, it, it's very tough. And you'll see when you look at Kickstarter, you'll see very high amounts of miniature game. They'll, they'll be half a million dollars, million dollars, million and a half dollars. Uh, but what people don't realize is that the cost of those is extremely high and they need every penny of that just to produce it. And I don't know whether you guys followed the, um, the Crom Kickstarter Conan rise of monsters. Uh, uh, I saw it. I, yeah, I didn't completely follow along with it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Very beautiful game. Pre-painted miniatures. Sounds like it was going to be a big winner. Um, and they canceled it once partnered with Reaper launched it again, made uh, made their goal 103,000, but it still wasn't going to be enough to get it in stores. And they ultimately canceled the, uh, the Kickstarter and it's not available. Wow. Yeah. Did they wind up refunding everybody their money? Did, did anyone, or yeah. did they cancel the Kickstarter? Well, I, I, I don't think they ever built it because it builds it if the Kickstarter goes, if you oh, so they it. killed, they killed the Kickstarter before it finished. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's, that's they were, they were using a low amount, I think to get pledges to, to get interest. And, but what they really needed was a half million million dollars and they only got a hundred thousand. Yeah, it's it's interesting when when people see like uh, you know talk to because we know um, we know Stephen Porcone, a uh, guy who does Dwarven Forge, uh -huh. and um, and and he uh, you know he gets these million dollar kickstarters. You know, it's like oh, it's a million three, a million and a half, right? But uh, you know what people forget is is that you know for the million three, a million two of that is delivering the product like he right. he makes money off of them but he does not he's not like rolling in money from those things right. you know they, yeah. they do get made and he is building a stock of things that he can you know like like he doesn't it's not so much that he makes his money off the kickstarter i don't think i think most of his money is really made in the sales afterwards after that whole thing is as funded because right. it's a it's a lot and he, and he puts in tons of hours because he hand sculpts all those pieces yeah yeah so it it it's a major investment. I, I think uh, people get stars in their eyes when they see these things like, Oh my God, they made so much money off the Kickstarter. It's like, e they brought right. in a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, when you look at the Kickstarters and you go, okay, there's a million dollars for this miniatures game or a million dollars for seven C. Well, really John wick is the one getting off pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause he's just publishing paper. Right. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah, he yeah. does the, now that, yeah, if you can do that. And one of the things that, that I, when I, so when I did my Kickstarter, uh, that I, there was managed to fund, um, I had a, a print and play version that I put up and that was just straight money because I had to do the cards anyway. It was a card game. Right. So I do the, I had to do the cards anyway. So the PDFs were just, they were already there. So everyone who just bought on the PDF was just straight money into my pocket 
uh, but the, the for the cards, that was all I had to take out production costs. So mm-hmm. I did make some made some pretty good money on that. But you really make a lot of money off your PDFs. So if you want to back somebody's Kickstarter and you just want to give them money, like you're like I love this product, I just want it to be made. Uh, you can just back their PDF level, and they love that because oh, yeah. that's that's no outlay on there. They got to make all that stuff anyway. That's just yep. extra. It's extra money for them. So if you want to support them, you can just give them that that amount, and and usually. Uh, sometimes that's even better than buying the actual physical product. Yeah, well, it's it's definitely a, a better profit margin. Yeah, certainly. A little inside baseball on the Kickstarter. There. All right, yeah. Bryce. Uh, is there is there anything else that that you want to mention before we before we wrap this up? Any any? No, other? just uh, thanks for having me on, guys. It's been a great talk. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thanks and for coming be, on. You said you're going to be at GaryCon, right? Twenty eighteen. Uh, we are. We we have a booth for for GaryCon two thousand eighteen. So next year. We will definitely hit Gary Khan and we will definitely be back at Origins, which is sort of our home convention. Uh, and I'll be at, uh, I should be at Con on the Cob this year, which takes place in Ohio. Right, right. I keep hearing about that Con on the Cob. Is that a good con? Good con? Uh, you know, I've been telling Andy Hopp, the guy who runs it, he, he, he produces the game called uh, Low Life for Savage Worlds. I don't know if you guys ever played it, but it's a fun little post apocalyptic thing um, uh, that I've been coming, I want to come for the last five years. and every year something happens that stops me from from going uh, but this year i'm I, i've already committed so yeah i'd like to, be, yeah, I'd, like to I'd like to check out uh con on the cob i'd also like to check out uh game hole i hear game hole is, is game hole con is yeah fantastic yeah. and then yeah. uh, what was a grand con was the other one that i heard that's really good out there all the good cons are out that way yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you get a chance uh here in indiana i know everyone goes to gen con right. but now that gen con is a sellout in April, you come to a, a little convention called Hoosier Con, and it, everything about it is free. There's no badge cost. There's no event cost. Wow. They raise the money through fundraisers through the rest of the year, hmm. and you go for free. And for three days, you play games for free, and you attend the convention for free. And as a result, the attendance has just gone up through the roof. And I would anticipate next year about 3,000 attendees. Wow. That's a good wow. number for, for and it's just a role playing con, a role playing board game. Uh, board games, kind of? role playing, uh, right. a few LARPs. Right. Yeah. That's like it sounds like Total Con. Total Con's cool like that. It's just big enough to be awesome. Like right. not overly big, but but big enough that, that you're hanging out with, you know, two thousand of your best friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. Hey Pete. Before you uh, start the closer, I just wanted yes, to sir. say that uh, thank you to uh, Dad Game John, DWiz73, uh, Engineer230, uh, Faye Gwent, Gate Jumper one myself, <laughs> and my mom for uh, all <laughs> pitching in in the chat room. So thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, yeah we had a good good chat yeah, yeah. this week. Yeah. Please, please follow us, like us, tell your friends. We could, uh, we you know, we'd love to have uh, more viewers and more people to interact with. Yeah, cool. absolutely. And go back and watch a lot of our old shows. We've had uh, uh, Menser and Cask and yes. and Ed Greenwood and, and 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 you know, none of these guys compared to Bryce though. I mean, Bryce <laughs> no. is, is the man. But uh <laughs> that's, that's the best plug ever. I'm recording right. not using it on my fan. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're the guest on this week. You're the greatest guest we ever had, right? Yeah, the best one ever. <laughs> Best one right. yet. Right. While you're here. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Bryce. Well, thanks for coming on. Everybody, yes, make sure you, you, you check uh, Fearlight Games. Uh, it's fearlightgames.com, right? Is that that's correct? Yes. 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 Oh, but but uh, if you want to, you can visit our, our Fearlight uh, Facebook page. Uh, we yep. also have a Google group for uh, Baker Street. Hop yep. on there. Ask me a few questions. Be happy to help. And the, awesome. the link is really long, but there's a drive through RPG link. Uh, it, it's right there. So if, if you look down below this where, video. Where? where? Right there. Right it there. better be right there. there. No, right. It better be there or there. <laughs> Wherever you're pointing, it better be there. Right. And you can uh, you can find Bryce on Twitter at Bryce, B-R-Y-C-E underscore Whitaker. Now that's W-H-I-T-A-C-R-E. He's got that, that English word, Acre. Uh, like the A tree. <laughs> uh, but 
definitely check out his games. They are really cool. Uh, and if you want to check, if you really want to, okay, so if you want to see a play test of how Baker Street runs, uh, you can, there's a really good show we did on game school. You can go to TSRPN.com, go to game school. I don't know off the top of my head. I should have wrote this down, which episode it is, but it's right in there. You'll find it's really easy. Um, and, and we do a, we interview Bryce there. We talk about the game. We talk about how characters are made way more in depth than what we did on the show. And then we run like a 15, 20 minute demo of how an adventure goes. It's uh, it's pretty cool. And, uh, you get to see the, the beautiful Satine Phoenix and, uh, the ever charming Chad Parrish on that one. So, um, and if you have any questions about the French and Indian war, also contact Bryce, um, uh, yes. and he'll be able to help you out. <laughs> right. Or, or Jack, Jack, Jack will answer your questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah maybe. Jack will be at the cock U university, uh, <laughs> library. Yes. Uh, I'll research. be at the, uh, the cock and ball center for Grundle right. studies. Right. And, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and Hey, Hey, this week, Jack, you're our star for the, for the, for the website. Jack started a blog this week. Jack I is, did. uh, Jack is an insurance adjuster, and he gets to see a very interesting <laughs> slice of humanity. No, no, Jack knows an insurance adjuster. Jack knows somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. I always get that confused, Jack. Yeah, Jack no, no. knows. I checked with an attorney. I'm good. Okay. Oh. As long as he doesn't use it. names, right? Just Jack. That, just right. Jack's pain. <laughs> no, right. No names. No specific things. But yeah, it's it's uh it's it's gonna be interesting. I already have the next one written. I'm gonna post it on Friday. So awesome. Right. Um, yeah, we're good to go. So and, yeah. And so, for anyone who does not know Jack's uh, Facebook page, when he vents on Facebook, it it literally you know you you feel better uh through reading <laughs> his pain of what he's had to deal with that day or whatever it is he's lamenting on. And it is lamentation. So yeah, it is. I, I, it I is. really, it, it, I am looking forward to this myself. So uh, yeah, people I have been begging him. him. They've been begging yes. him to write this yes. blog. It's, it's, it's good. So. It's going to be fun. All right, everybody. Well, that's it for this episode. Let me do the thing. Uh, here we go. All right, everybody. You have just enjoyed another episode of the Myth Wits Podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Jump into the chat room like a bunch of fine folks we had tonight and ask our guests questions because we'll answer them. Ain't that right, y'all? Uh, yeah, y'all. Yeah, y'all. If you missed our live show, you can always <laughs> catch the Encore episodes at YouTube forward slash Myth Wits. Find us on MythWits.com, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, and oops, we're leaving SoundCloud. SoundCloud's circling the drain, so um, I think we're... Probably moving to Podbean. Uh, do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and a review on iTunes. Screenshot that post on our Facebook page, and I'll send you, um, I don't know, I'll send you Jack's stinky poop coat. Uh, Mythwits is oh. part of the DSR <laughs> Podcast Network. If you like us, you're bound to like the other great shows there. Uh, check out TSRPN.com. And MythWits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out studio7.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Please join our mailing list. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And Mike? Hey, Pete. How was John Wick 2? Was that uh, a good movie? <laughs> I don't, hey, let's talk about it in two weeks, eh? Ah, good. That was an insight.